You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible. The literary scholar Eric Auerbach commented that biblical narrative was fraught with background. By that he means that we get told what people do and what they say, but on the whole neither they nor their actions are described to us. We're not told what their motives were, and all those things we have to work out for ourselves, from the hints and clues in what they do and say. This is totally unlike modern storytelling, and it's very unlike too the epic tradition of ancient Greece, where we keep getting told that Odysseus is wily. In the Hebrew class today I was looking at Genesis chapter 24. I noticed all sorts of things about the telling of that story that I hadn't spotted before. It's the story of Abraham's servant being sent to get a wife for Isaac. Now, as Robert Alters pointed out to us, this story uses a type scene. One of those short little bits of narrative that everybody knows and understands, you know, like when in a cowboy movie you see a guy in a black hat walking to moody music down the centre of a street, and you just know there's going to be a guy in a white hat facing him, and there'll be a shootout. That kind of scene. And in the Bible, when a guy goes to a foreign country and meets a girl at a well, you just know that wedding bells are going to be ringing any moment. There are a few other details to it. The girl has to hurry home and tell her family, and there has to be some food, and... But the basic outline is dead simple. Guy in a foreign country, girl at a well, wedding bells. OK, we've got Abraham's servant, who has the mission of getting a wife for Isaac, who arrives at the well. And he obviously knows the rules, because when he arrives at the well, he prays to God. Let the girl to whom I shall say, Please offer your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. He prays. And having prayed that, before he had finished speaking, there was Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, coming with her water jar on her shoulder. Notice what's happening already here in verse 15. The telling has slowed down enormously. Instead of just saying, before he'd finished speaking, there was Rebecca, or even, there was Rebecca, daughter of Bethuel, you've got all this, there was Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. The telling has slowed down enormously. And with biblical stories, when the telling slows down, it's just like a film, when you go into slow motion, it's a sure clue that something important is going to happen. So, from verse 15 onwards, we're pricking up our ears and we're watching carefully to spot what happens at this well, wedding bells ringing all the time. Verse 16, The girl was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. It's interesting. The girl was very fair to look upon, beautiful to look upon, is the Hebrew, more or less. Now, you could have just said she was beautiful. That's quite sufficient in itself. But beautiful to look upon? Do you really need to say that we're not talking about her beauty of soul and all the rest? No, the reason it's there, the look upon bit, is there, is so that we notice that we're now supposed to be seeing things from Abraham's servant's point of view. And we watch Abraham's servant watching the girl, who's beautiful. And somehow or other, and it's not explained how, he seems to know that she's a virgin a suitable match for Isaac. She goes down to the spring, fills her jar, and comes up again. That down and up business is just a little detail, but it lets us picture the scene. It's one of those springs that are down in a little sort of cave, and the servant is standing nearby, watching. Verse 17, and the servant ran to meet her, and running is an important part of these stories, though it's not usually the guy who runs, and said, Please give me a little sip of the water in your jar. We'll talk about the little sip business another day. And she said, Drink, my lord, and quickly lowered her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll draw for your camels also until they have finished drinking. That's going to be a big task. Ten camels that have been doing a long journey through the desert are going to be pretty thirsty. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. This Rebecca is a fast mover, dynamic, literally. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Now what's going on here? 
Okay. He's going to learn whether the Lord had made his journey successful. That's the plot. But what's this gazing in silence business? I'm beginning to get the feeling that Abraham's servant fancies Rebecca himself as he gazes at her in silence. I mean, why has the teller of this story bothered to tell us that he gazed in silence? He'd hardly have been gazing while he chatted, now would he? No, the point of that is so that we notice the servant noticing the girl. Now, it plays no part in the plot. There is no menage a trois, there is no love triangle. There's just a nice little detail that this servant sent to get a wife for his master really rather fancies the girl himself. That's how biblical storytelling works. And sometimes those details are nothing more than a nice little tweak to keep you interested, like here. And sometimes they have great meaning. Good hearers spot them, even when they don't matter too much, like here. Of course there's loads more in this story, but we've no time for that now. I'm over a minute over time already. Wait for the next thrilling instalment. Bye for now.